Welcome, everybody. We're very excited to be here. Uh, Barry, Mark, myself are uh, excited to talk to you about what a return to music education looks like. And we'll also talk about some national trends that are occurring around as well. But before we jump into that, I think it's important for us to dive into a little bit of the science and see um, kind of what's out there. I know many of you have already read uh, the study and reviewed the third release and all the things that we've done with it. But I think we have a common language deep dive into what we're going to be doing. So uh, one thing we have here is our co-chairs. And so I want to introduce uh, Dr. Mark Speed. He's the president of CBDNA, CBDNA and the director of bands at Clemson University. This whole uh, project is Mark Speed's idea to begin with. Uh, he called me back in late, April, late March, early April. It's like, hey, James, we have an issue here. <clears throat> I have contacted a bunch of other organizations. Um, I think this is going to be airborne. I think it's going to be aerosol. And so uh, Mark had done a diligent uh, read through of all the research that was existing at that time, which at the time was not a whole lot. And uh, once we kind of had that conversation, I was all on board. And then we kind of got, uh, got to work. And I think we pushed each other in ways we hadn't anticipated before, but uh, worked out really well. <clears throat> and uh, let this, me jump in there, oh, since Please you're do. giving me credit to uh, James has been an unbelievable advocate for our profession. And uh, he and I worked uh, so sometimes 80 hour weeks uh, once the lockdown happened, all through the summer, uh, through thick and thin. So he's been a great um, partner. Um, the two of us made a great team and I think we got a lot accomplished and a lot of the credit goes to James. You're too kind, Mark, thank you. Um, so one thing that Mark and I found out that was tricky right off the bat was how expensive this was gonna be. Uh, when we first started this project, we, and I think the, the price is important, so he's gonna kind of flow through why I'm doing this. So we originally started with a $37,000 price tag and Mark and I like, yeah, we can raise 37 grand. And then it turned into 125,000 and then it turned into a quarter of a million and then it turned into 320,000, which we're seeing now. Uh, because of that, we never, at least I haven't, raised that kind of money in such a short amount of time. And so we were, we have to really thank our friends of the NAM Foundation. So if you have a local music merchant, we really want you to thank them for making this aerosol study happen and making music education happen again during the pandemic. Uh, they matched 40% of all the funds that we were raised. And so that was a huge deal that we had. And then our other uh, three lead funders would be the NFHS Foundation, the Diodario Foundation, and CBDNA. Uh, these four entities account for about 60% of the funding. And with that, we have uh, all of these folks on this screen. Uh, and then the folks on this screen also really helped us out with, uh, with getting the rest of the 40%. 40% is a huge chunk of money. And then we get into, we had contributing collegiate conference bands that helped out. We had individual school band programs at the collegiate level that helped out. And we had a whole lot of organizations that didn't help monetarily, but helped in other ways that we needed support for in this project. Needless to say, in my tenure as in the music profession, I have not seen so many organizations come together for one cause ever. And so this has been a huge highlight for me. And I think it shows that when th things are really threatening the arts, we are able to get people together and make things happen. Uh, I want to introduce you to our two lead researchers that we have, uh, Dr. Shelley Miller of the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, Dr. Miller is a uh, mechanical engineering professor and has a lot of study into um, the background of um, infectious disease transmission, indoor air quality, and CO2 emissions. Uh, she serves on the International um, Society of Indoor Air Quality and Control. And she's also authored a uh, paper on air quality in the engineering handbook, which is the standard bearer for all of the uh, indoor environmental air handling systems. Uh, Dr. Yelena Shrebrink of the University of Maryland. She is a um, professor in the modeling of the built environment. Uh, she's, she's given guest lectures at Stanford, MIT, uh, Harvard. She's designed new courses at the University of Maryland as well as Harvard. And she um, has also served with uh, Dr. Shelley Miller on the International Air Quality Control uh, board as well. Uh, both these two are amazing uh, scientists, and I think we've been very fortunate to have their guidance as we've moved forward in this. Um, and so where they really tag team well is uh, Dr. Miller is very uh, adept at the APS measurements and collecting aerosols and finding out how they move around the room. And Dr. Schrebing's um, real um, power in this study is taking all that information and data and creating a model that's actually a usable model. And you're going to see both of their work in this presentation today. Uh, to round out the rest of our research team, on the University of Colorado Boulder side, we have Prof Professor Jean Hertzberg and Abhishek Kumar. They are our flow visualization specialists. We have Dr. T uh, Samir Patel and Taya Stockman, and they are APS data collection specialists. We have uh, Dr. Taryn Tuhi, and he is a um, 
experimental design specialist, and then Dr. Marina Vance, and she is a masking specialist on the University of Colorado side. At the University of Maryland, we have uh, Nicholas Matisse, Sebastian Romo, Lingxing Wang, and Dr. Xing Zhe Zhu, uh, and they are all modeling specialists with uh, Dr. Schriebrink. And this is a team that is dedicated to finding out how every particle in a room moves around. And that is a lot of brain power that I don't have. Mark might, but I don't. Uh, and then we're also fortunate to have on this University of Maryland team that's not listed here is a special consultant with uh, Don Milton. And he's an infectious disease expert that does a lot of things with the NIH, the CDC, through the University of Maryland. So we're very fortunate with the team we have. So let's dive into what this, uh, what this looks like. This is aerosol concentrations over time. This is the APS data. APS stands for aerosol particle spectrometer. And we're gonna look at the, uh, the data on the trumpet right now. So here we have the gray bar shows unmitigated play on average over about a 25 to 45 minute period of time. And then the black line is basically our tops and our bottoms. And then uh, you'll see here on this yellowish orangish color, uh, this is the mitigated play. And that mitigated play is with a, um, a bell cover that's made of two layers of high denier uh, material with a MERV-13 layer in between. If you see this little guy down here, this is what happened when we took a blue surgical mask that meets the F2100 ASTM standard or the GBT36 or GBT3610 standard. This is a Chinese standard. Uh, both of them are level two style masks, and you'll see that we are really able to cut the particle concentrations down a lot. We'll get into more of that in a little bit. As we go into the woodwinds, uh, we'll look at the, the uh, focus on the oboe. <clears throat> this is our really big offender in the instrumental world. And you'll see our scale on the, right, on the left side here has changed to whole numbers. Um, and we can blame the oboe for that. So what happens is uh, we didn't know why the um, aerosols were being produced by instruments at the beginning. Mark had a hypothesis, which I think is proving to be true, that you need a wet vibrating surface in order to make that happen. So when we look at the oboe, we actually have multiple wet vibrating surfaces that create the aerosol and how they create the aerosols as a human being when we breathe we have large respiratory droplets that we emit just naturally by breathing speaking doing anything we do uh, when they hit the wet vibrating surfaces uh, those large respiratory particles get chopped up into a finer aerosol the large respiratory particles are pretty harmless uh, by and large because they fall helplessly to the ground uh, after about a half a meter to a meter so we get our six foot recommendation from the cdc because they just took that meter distance as the maximum for large respiratory droplets and doubled it well, when Mark was doing his original research here, uh, we are seeing this aerosol and these aerosol particles, which are big enough to carry the COVID-19 virus, can hang out in the environment for minutes uh, to tens of minutes at a time. And so when we originally talked, and Mark, I don't know if you want to cover the flu, we thought the flu was going to be the death nail of, or the COVID-19 was going to be the death nail of the flu. Yeah, we thought, uh, you know, because all the other instruments, uh, the air had to travel through the instrument um, that somehow the aerosol would be stopped by the instrument itself, mostly. Uh, you know, if you think of the flute just blowing, blowing into the air, basically, around the player, uh, we, I, I just assumed the flute would literally be the worst offender. But it turns out, because there's really no wet vibrating surface, like a reed or lips uh, buzzing through a mouthpiece, uh, the flute is actually the best instrument for uh, not producing aerosol. It's just like blowing a candle out, there's not much aerosol produced. You might have some larger droplets, which are going to fall to the floor pretty quickly, um, but, but really not much aerosol to speak of. So uh, that was the good news on the flute. Oboe not yeah, so at this time, Right. But at this time, we we're looking for any good news we could get. Uh, we start looking at the vocal area. So the theater stuff is kind of what we're looking at with the uh, teacher voice. That's the best way to describe that one. Uh, but then we also have soprano singing and baritone singing, and we see the same kind of trends here. Uh, one thing we see here that soprano singing is higher than baritone singing is physics again. The higher the pitch you sing in, the more your vocal cords are going to vibrate. The more they vibrate, the more they chop up those large respiratory particles, the more finer aerosols you're spewing out. The lower the voice, the less the vibration, the less aerosols, the larger droplets that are coming out. Larger droplets are easier to mitigate because they get caught in things a lot easier than the aerosols do. So we're going to look at mitigation effectiveness. And I have to apologize. Is there, a, is there somebody having a microphone on in the background? No? OK. Just making sure. So what we have here on the, uh, the sampling for, the, um, for our bell covers is a couple of things we want to look at when we look at mitigation effectiveness. So you're going to see the saxophone will say, well, we have a 64% reduction in what we're doing. All right, that doesn't sound impressive. But we're only starting at 0.7 parts per cubic centimeter. When an unmitigated play, we bring it down to 0.32 parts per cubic centimeter. 
uh, we consider near background somewhere around that 0.25 ish. Um, it's so about the background level of the lab that we're using. When we look at the oboe, the oboe has an overall aerosol release of four parts per cubic centimeter of unmitigated play. And then when we put the bell covers on, it reduces it down to 0.5 parts per cubic centimeters, 96% reduction. Both of them are bringing it down to near background level. And I think that's the important part you want to see. So when we look at this slide here of the effectiveness. Uh, we rank it in order of the percentage of effectiveness that we have. Obviously, we have 64% here in saxophone and 98% in the soprano singer, but all of these are going from whatever level they're at to around near background levels of aerosol, which is really important as we get back into the classroom. So as we look at this, we look at the trumpet and the APS concentration over time. And I'm just going to show you some trends and go through the slides quickly. If you want to see these more, they're on the study website. You can go check those out as long as you want. Uh, so here we have bell cover, no play with our trumpet. We tried to begin the study uh, using a pantyhose because on our flow visualization, it looked like it was really effective. So I got 80 denier thick pantyhose, plot that on the end of the trumpet, and we are seeing like the air stop. But we didn't see at the time, and so if you remember back to July, which is why our guidance changed, we were actually having more aerosols coming through the particles, or more aerosol particles coming through the pantyhose than what we had with no bell cover at all. So we adjusted that guidance to have the thickness of the pantyhose that we had originally recommended and added the MERV 13 filter material to it. And then you'll see what happens here. They drop way down here, which is great. Then we have a uh, soft reading with no mask here. We have a bell cover, bell cover. These are dynamic differentials here. We have the background, bell cover, surgical mask, which is very close to the background level. Bell cover, bell cover, no bell cover, bell cover, spandex, because everyone has spandex. So we wanted to see how it plays up with the bell cover. Turns out not as effective as the uh, high denier thickness material with the MERV 13 filter in the middle. We look at the flute just to show you kind of the difference. If you look at this uh, axis over here on the left, these are very small. So we have no bell cover flute playing and bell cover flute playing. We're below the background level of aerosol. Uh, so there's really no uh, need to do more than just put uh, the head joint under or behind a mask and have some sort of a cottony um, cap to the end of the end of the barrel. Uh, when we look at singers, we're looking at the same thing: no mask to mask, no mask masking, reading, no mask, mask background mask. All about the same trends in there, uh, so that's very effective. We also want to look at the bell cover. Uh, so we have no bell cover in clarinet, bell cover reading, no bell cover, bell cover background, no bell cover. This is an important one I'll cover in a second. Back to bell cover. What we found is the longer you play, the more aerosols that are produced. We don't know exactly why that occurs. It could be because of more condensation in the instrument. It could be because your body's reacting to the stress you're putting on it over playing. Even if you're an expert player, your body is still going through something while you play. Uh, we also don't know if like as you play, things just get tired in your embouchure and you're starting to release more respiratory droplets into the instrument. So we really know that, but all we do know is the longer you play, the more aerosols you produce. And this graph shows that really clearly. Then we get into here, we wanted to see, well, we saw those bags popping up and we wanted to see how effective those were uh, because we've never recommended the bags for woodwind players. So here on this, uh, this uh, line here, we have bell cover and we had the bell and the keyhole in a box and they designed a special box for the clarinet inside. Then over here, we had the bell covered with the bell and the keel in a box. And we saw the bell covered, the bell only in the box. And you just see there's not a big difference between the two. Then we have the bell covered with the bell and the keel in a box. We see the rise we would normally expect. Then we uncovered the bell with the bell and the keel in a box. We pop right back up to where we were. Then we flipped the measurement. So here we have the sample near the bell with the bell uncovered, just like we would expect to see. Sample near the uh, keys with the bell uncovered, we see a tremendous drop. Then we sample near the keys with the bell cover to see if there's a back pressure coming through. Uh, we are still within the same margin as what we are here with our bell covers. And then we sample near the bell with the bell covered again and saw the drop again. What we're seeing from this data is we're not going above near background level of aerosol out of the keyholes. There's also a lot of variables that you wouldn't necessarily see in a, in a uh, lab test. Like, so the finger is going to be down, not all the keys are going to be up, your fingers are going to be covering the keyholes. Uh, to some percentage of extent, so blocking the aerosols from getting out in the environment. So we're really not seeing a need to have the bag, for instance, over the clarinet. Mark, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Yeah, the, the, the original photograph we showed uh, in the first presentation back in July had, the, uh, had a clarinet in the bag, and suddenly manufacturers started selling uh, woodwind bags. That, that original photo was showing a way of collecting aerosols uh, from escaping into the room so they could measure the amount of aerosols while the player was playing. So uh, some unscrupulous uh, companies ran with that. So please, 
You don't need woodwind bags. Uh, the amount of aerosol coming out of the keyholes is negligible. Just make sure you have uh, a quality bell cover and you're good to go. Yeah, it's really not, it's, you're not, the return you're getting on that is not worth what you're putting into it. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna look at modeling of a UC rehearsal hall. This is the University of Colorado Boulder. Uh, this is a standard-ish size rehearsal hall. It's a little on the big side, but it's not so big that you wouldn't see it in a lot of other schools. So this hall is 12.42 uh, meters long by nine meters high, nine and a half meters-ish wide. You'll see the air is coming in here and the air is going out down here. Uh, everyone here in blue is a non-infected person. In fact, this red person also non-infected. I have to get my graphic updated, I apologize. And this person in red over here, person player number one, is uh, our infected human being. They, let's assume that they are asymptomatic because if they are symptomatic and show up to this scenario, we have some other moral issues that are going on in this conversation. So what we look at here is here's all the rehearsal space that we have uh, for the actual environment that exists in that room. We also have down here 48 quanta per hour for COVID-19 virus, but they chose 48 quanta per hour because in the uh, retrospect of the super spreader events, that's about what we're seeing spread around. So when we look at what happens in here, we get these two cool models. So on the left side here is without a mask and on the right side here is with a mask. When we look at this one, I like to call this one the spaghetti noodle model. It's striking every particle that exists in that room and it's flowing around. The darker the blue, the better. Uh, the closer you get to greens and yellows, you're getting to 60 to 70% risk of infection. And by the time you get to oranges and reds, you're talking 90 to 100% chance of risk of infection. When we put a mask on with this same singer, we see a lot more dark blue spaghetti noodles. And we see this one really thick spaghetti noodle uh, containing it. The reason why is that when you sing, you sing out in a plane. And so it spreads out quickly at a head level where everyone's breathing. When you put a mask on and contain that, you instantly take that away. And any seepage that's from that mask is going out the back of the mask, typically, uh, and then being caught by the, the HVAC system. When we look at the ISO concentration cloud, it's basically anyone inside this big blue cloud is uh, at risk of becoming infected. When we put a uh, mask on them, you see that this number two person here, no longer in the cloud, their risk of infection goes down by 85%. We're not saying this is safe, but we're saying we can definitely reduce the risk of infection by a pretty significant margin. Another thing you'll realize is that this is a 60 minute rehearsal and we did that on purpose to make sure that we can cover all the different things that we have for classes and rehearsals that have to happen on a, uh, non, on a, on a very rigid schedule. So if we were to think about this, this ISO concentration cloud after a half an hour would be this big here. It'd basically be the size of the yellow part for the entire ISO concentration cloud after 30 minutes, which is what our recommendation is which then removes a lot of risk for becoming infected in a cold. When we take the same thing, and I'm gonna have Mark talk about this in a second. This is a clarinet uh, example. You'll see when we put the uh, clarinet with the, um, the bell cover and the slitted mask, you'll see how close the ISO concentration cloud stays. And we are really reducing the risk of infection significantly uh, for an instrumentalist with a uh, bell cover with the high denier fabric and mercury tea material and the slitted surgical style mask. Uh, now, Mark actually has good information on this happening in real life and not just in a model. Yeah, and back in uh, late September, we had an incident at a university where um, a clarinet choir uh, was rehearsing. And uh, one of the, one of the uh, I think there were nine clarinets in the rehearsal. And one of them woke up with some symptoms in the morning, went to their university health center. The health center did not test them and told them uh, just just go about your business, you probably don't have COVID. So he went to this rehearsal. Uh, this was on a Tuesday morning, I believe, or Tuesday early afternoon. And um, as after the rehearsal was over, he uh, started feeling worse. He called his teacher. The teacher told him to go to the hospital to get tested. He did. He did test positive. And in the meantime, the next, uh, over the next 24 hours, one of the other clarinet players also developed symptoms and later tested positive for COVID. And we initially thought that this was a spreading event in a clarinet choir rehearsal. Uh, we did some detailed contact tracing and found out that both of these students were at a party the Friday night before in a situation where there were a lot of people in, a, in an enclosed space, no one was masked, they were partying and drinking and you know college students. Uh, somebody at that party unknowingly had the virus and spread it to a lot of people at that party. So two of these clarinet players uh, eventually tested positive within uh, 48 hours. So they were 
one was symptomatic, one was asymptomatic, but they used all the mitigations that we recommended in our study and none of the other seven, none of the other seven clarinet players ever tested positive for COVID. So we had two out of nine with COVID, bell covers, masking, six foot social distancing, 30 minute rehearsal, and no one else was infected. And we've had a number of other cases in the college world, uh, including my own ensemble. I've gotten two alerts on my app on my phone, uh, one a classroom setting and one a rehearsal setting where somebody in my uh, immediate vicinity eventually tested positive and uh, you know, I've, I've been testing negative the whole time. So these mitigations do work. Thank you, Mark. So uh, the, what we're looking at for rehearsal and general procedures, this is gonna be on airflow. So a couple things, uh, several things that we noticed uh, throughout the study is outdoor rehearsals using individual mitigation techniques as described above, that's our number one thing because it's the safest way to go. However, we do know in the winter time in the Northern hemisphere, it gets cold outside, uh, especially in the state of Illinois. You guys have experienced winter uh, recently. Uh, so then we look at, we want indoor air with elevated outdoor air exchange from the HVAC system or we wanna have indoor air with typical outdoor air exchange rates. We wanna have MERV-13 filters in the HVAC system or appropriately sized HEPA air cleaners. Uh, then we have indoor uh, or with outdoor air exchange rates from open windows supplemented with appropriately sized HEPA air cleaners when the airflow is reduced. What we're trying to say here is we want you to avoid the closet style rehearsal space, right? We don't want you to be in a tiny box with no air ventilation, no windows, no HEPA air cleaners because that's just a recipe for disaster as far as that goes. Um, now, one thing that we have found that's been pretty effective is you can buy HEPA air cleaners uh, for the size of your room. And that can do a couple things. It can increase the amount of ACH rate you have, which is the air change rates per hour. And it can, um, uh, so if you have a low HVAC system, that say it's like one to two per hour, you can bolster that with the uh, having HVAC or having HEPA air cleaners in that room. Uh, so our five principal recommendations we have here is masking everything. Mask the students, mask the instruments, make sure the materials you use matter. Use a standards-based surgical style mask and use a MERV-13 filter material inside of a high denier bell cover. Uh, make sure we're following the CDC six foot guidance. Uh, we have never said anything different than six foot guidance because everything we've run has been based off what the CDC is saying. The CDC has always said six feet. So all of our experiments have been based off and modeling has been based off of six foot guidance. This applies both indoors and outdoors. So just because outdoor air is safer, doesn't mean that you can just congregate close together because that defeats the purpose of being outside. We want a little extra space for the trombone because of all the different factors that go in with trombones. Uh, so trombone players out there, I apologize. We want to see a 30 minute rehearsal. Uh, now I know in practicality standpoints, this is not always easy to do. Uh, however, we do know that there's a lot of models you can do to make this happen. So if you have a 45, 50 minute rehearsal, do some non-rehearsal things at the beginning, rehearse for the next 30 minutes, let the air change thing go out and away you go. We want to see rooms clear out for a minimum of one air change before your next rehearsal period. So as it was at the same class or a different class, we want to clear that room out and have at least one air change before we go back in and start rehearsing again. Uh, when we have airflow, we want to make sure outdoors air is best. If we can put a HEPA air cleaners and filtration systems in, that's great. And if we can increase the ACH rates mechanically, that'd be awesome. Uh, you can talk to your facility management about that and see if you can find the ways to make that happen. Start with your custodial staff or your principal and uh, see what direction they take you. Because if you have a Johnson control style uh, management system, they'll know what to do. If you don't run off of that system, then uh, they'll be able to figure out how that's all managed. Then on hygiene, we want to make sure that we're not having unmitigated spit valve release, condensation valve, water key, whatever you'd like to call it. I don't want to offend anyone with my terminology there. But we don't want it unmitigated. So we want to have it a puppy pad that would be absorbent of that or have some other device that the market has created that collects that, uh, that condensation. We also want to make sure hand washing is good. If you were a poor hand washer pre-pandemic, we sure hope you're a good hand washer during the pandemic and that those great skills of hand washing follow you after this pandemic is over. Wash your hands uh, and have your students wash their hands. It's really a good life skill. And the other thing we want to do is in the storage area is want to make sure that we have uh, anything that's a high touch point. Now we're not worried about the fomite uh, transmission as much as we were at the beginning of the pandemic. Fomite transmission is a touch to contact transmission. However, we want to make sure like doorknobs and other storage areas that are highly used and highly used by a lot of people do get disinfected over the course of time, just to make sure 
that uh, that we aren't spreading other things around or that we don't have some sort of a buildup of the COVID-19 virus and it becomes a format issue. But that is not the main source of transmission, so it's not what we put a lot of effort into doing. So with that, I'm going to thank everybody. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I believe we are open for Q&A time. So thanks, James. We, the way that some of these questions were arise just for the panel is um, I made some calls to directors throughout the state, Central Illinois, Northern Illinois, East, West, and tried to get just a, a general sense of questions. A lot of these you kind of covered, but maybe I'll ask again and we can just solidify. Um, some of these are also um, maybe a little bit of just asking for recommendation and guidance that are going to change from location to location. And of course, everyone, your local government, uh, your local authority, be your school board, be your um, county, et cetera, is going to have the ultimate say on these. These are recommendations. So um, first, have there been any documented outbreaks as a result of rehearsals? I think that was covered already as a no, Mark, but. Yes, uh, we do not know of any um, transmission of the virus between players in a rehearsal or performance. Uh, and that includes band, choir, and orchestra, as long as they're using all these mitigations that we just told you about. Yeah, we did have a couple uh, scares though, and I'll kind of walk through this. We had a school that had 11 students in a choir uh, report becoming infected with COVID-19. Turns out all 11 of those uh, sang in the same church choir that did not follow the mitigation strategies. And so, so then they brought it back and it looked like it was spreading through the high school choir, but outside of those 11, when they used the uh, mitigation strategies in the choir, nothing else. Uh, and with the mitigation, um, I think that James, you said, but it was it was very brief. Um, what type of, this is from the chat, what type of masks do you recommend for flutes? The surgical style mask, the uh, F2100 ASTM standard or the GPT3610 standard. Um, and those standards are both listed on the study webpage. And so you can go ahead and grab those. Uh, the reason why we use, I should clarify this too, the reason why we use the GB standard is that is the Chinese manufacturing standard for the, uh, the three-ply um, non-woven surgical style mask. And the non part what makes it effective, right? It's the type of material that has a static cling to aerosol particles. Uh, we use the GB standard and tell everyone that because the um, uh, more prevalent in the United States right now, because they're ahead of us in manufacturing. However, if you want to made products, that's great. Uh, just look for the F2100 ASTM standard and you'll be able to see that. Great, and Barry, thanks for posting in there so it has the illustration so everybody can see it. Um, yeah. Jeff, I'll come back to your question. I will include this. Um, I, I'm just I'm catching both as we go. So forgive me, I'm, I'm downloading some questions and then getting through the chat as well. Um, we've talked about the six feet. You guys made that strong recommendation and rationale as to why. Um, in the state of Illinois, there is a 50 person. We alluded to this. Would you recommend that there not be more than 50? Some ensembles have more than 50, and some programs are just not finding a way, even in a hybrid. So um, would anybody like to speak of the science behind the 50? Again, local authority is going to make their decisions, but um, that somebody might be able to take back to their administration. Um, I'll, I'll tackle that one first, James, and then uh, Barry and James, if you guys want to jump in, that's fine. I think, uh, you know, if you use six-foot social distancing um, between all your students, that is going to determine a, a, a cap for the space that you're in. Uh, so if you're in, let's say, a 3,000-square-foot band room, which is a typical size, perhaps, um, you're only going to get maybe 50 people into that room. Uh, if you go into a um, 12,000 square foot room, even keep, keeping the six foot distancing, you're going to increase the number of people um, using that six foot distance. So um, I'm not sure where the 50 number came. I know the state of Illinois is using that number, um, but the larger the space, and especially the larger the headroom, so the cubic space in the room, in theory, uh, you should be able to allow more people in that room. And, and Dr. Miller did a study on our basketball arena here at Clemson. I was concerned that basketball was uh, starting back with uh, 
20% fan, and they, of course, they wanted a band in there, and I was a little reluctant. She ran the numbers, and it turns out the volume of the air also makes a big impact on potential uh, transmission of the virus. So if you think of a basketball arena and the enormous amount of air in there, um, even with uh, about, I think we're ha we have 1,800 people in our indoor basketball arena, uh, that's still um, considered low risk in terms of the science. So, you know, really your own space, six foot distancing, basically determines how many you can squeeze in there. And you shouldn't necessarily try and cram everybody you can in there, but um, that, that's where the CDC guidance has come in. But I think to, to expound on that, the opposite direction is true as well. Like a 50 person recommendation is hard to follow because if you typically have a, um, a room 75, for example, and you say no more than 50 people in a room, you should have 50 people in that 75 person room anyway. That logic train goes both ways. So it's much more efficient to base it off the size by social distance than it is by any arbitrary number. Um, we're seeing things on um, Facebook, social media, et cetera. Um, I know that um, the green tents just came out, but uh, we're seeing concerts that are posted. <laughs> we're seeing concerts that are, are being presented for a variety of different um, levels. So high school, collegiate, et cetera. The early recommendation had the six by six grid, and now we're starting to see some arcs come in. So a more traditional ensemble setup, um, space, Spacing allowing, do you have a, a recommendation one way or the other for putting us back into a more traditional arc for the student view and um, audible sense? So I, I can cover the, let me cover the science part, then Mark, you can cover the auditory part if that works. We, we are still sticking, as far as I know, with straight rows um, in all directions, with six by six, um, because we have not seen anything that would change that yet as far as that goes. Um, we still have some more research to do that will be coming out in a fourth wave with some, uh, some additional things about space of the volume of the room and whatnot. Uh, I know that it is a pain in thinking about balance, blend, uh, tone, all the things we need to do in our band and orchestra and choir rooms. Um, but right now, like straight rows are just easier to mitigate overall. And I, don't, I haven't seen anybody recommending going back to the arc yet. Mark, have you? No, and I, I will tell you that in my own rehearsals, I'm keeping um, my students in a grid, uh, facing straight forward, not, not arced. I don't want to be the focal point for everyone's aerosol, potential aerosol. Uh, mm. you know, I, don't want, I don't want 50 kids shooting their aerosol right at my head, because that's, that's how we like it to hear everybody as a conductor. But in this instance, we don't want uh, every single person directing their bell right at right at us yeah and as far as the yeah. green oh. no go ahead no go ahead Barry. yeah i was just going to say too you know i think part of this you know some of us may be making some decisions based off how our rooms are structured especially if you have tiers built in so mm -hmm. you know that's the case in you know situations we know nationally so you know you have to work within those confines and i think the the main thing here i'm not trying to take away from you know, remaining in those straight lines, but the main thing is to remain facing forward. Um, that's that's what you can hear, you know, from what you're hearing from Mark and James and just the science behind this. So, you know, when you're looking at that scope of things, the angling in towards the conductor or towards you, the music educator, whoever's standing in front, that's, that's the major concern here. So continue to remain facing forward. And even if you have to work within your arcs that are concrete tiers in your in your music rooms, you know, still just continue staying forward. The chairs may look slightly art. You can't change that based on that structure of your room. So just something to consider. It's a really good point, Barry. Uh, and I'm going to address the green tent thing since you brought it up, Brian, if that's okay. Don't do tent. I, I'm sorry, but that you could, you, you could, for the amount of money you'd spend on the green tents, you could buy three bell covers for every student in that room. Um, and we also have no idea if it's safe. We have no idea what the risk mitigation levels are. We have no idea what's being collected in there. We also, I mean, I would hate to throw a kid in there and make them play for a half an hour and not know what their CO2 levels are going to do inside that tent. Um, we also don't know what happens when you open it up. 
There's a lot we don't know about that. What we do know is that bell covers, slitted masks, they're effective. They're highly effective at stopping respiratory aerosols. Uh, you combine that with distance, increased ventilation, and reduced time, and they are extraordinarily effective. And so um, I don't fault anyone for trying to be creative and finding a solution that works for them in their local community and their state. Um, but really, the science, the science is pretty clear so far. Uh, and it's not just our study that says that, right? We also have the University of Minnesota study that's completely independent from us that came to a very similar conclusion uh, as far as that goes. So um, if you're thinking about buying green tents, use them for your own personal camping uh, and don't, don't use them for the band room. I've, I've stepped off my soapbox, Brian. All right, thank you. Um, I want to be sure to cover these in the chat. So any of the three of you guys, I mean, I know that we're dialoguing, but um, if you've got some thoughts to weigh in there, um, uh, I'm going to skip around on my questions to help encompass some of the chat. So from the chat reading, my room does not have an HVAC system. I do have a giant blower for heat that I use when no students are in the room and window AC units. Are the HEPA air cleaners filters enough? Um, and then I wanted to tie to that, um, that is there is there a way that directors can help help if they may not have access to their maintenance through uh, facility meters, is there a way that they can help determine what they feel is appropriate or how to um, improve their situations? James, do you, uh, do you want to get into a preview of the next phase of our study? We could, we could uh, maybe talk a little bit about that, or do you want to sure. keep, keep that cat in the bag? Uh, we can do a, do you want me to dive into a preview? Well, I, I happen to have it sitting right here. Um, if you want to cover what you're going to cover, I'll cover the CFM stuff in large okay. volumes. Okay. So uh, we are looking at um, CO2 monitors, carbon dioxide monitors. Uh, th these are uh, relatively inexpensive monitors. I'm pointing at one, mine right now. It, it's reading uh, 520 parts per million of carbon dioxide in my office here right now, which is a great number. Um, and the reason we're looking at CO2 is... Um, as CO2 level rises in a particular room, so too potentially the amount of aerosol in a room. So even though we're not measuring aerosol directly, uh, CO2 acts as a proxy for aerosol. So as the CO2 level rises in a room, the uh, potential for cross-infection amongst the people in the room also rises. So we're not sure yet what number we're going to recommend that you keep under, but um, this one I bought uh, about four months ago for $50. They're not that cheap anymore because the word is leaking out. Um, but I'll just uh, I'll grab it and show you. The number will go up right away because my hand is on it. But you see the 500, uh, 521 number here? It's going up because I'm talking into it now. Um, but th that is measuring uh, carbon dioxide in real time. So as I see that number start to rise in my rehearsal, uh, I know that I'm getting into a, a you know, a, a situation where I might want to stop what I'm doing. So uh, I, that, that is the next part of the next phase of our study and we'll hopefully have some good recommendations on uh, these relatively inexpensive devices uh, this summer as you head into fall. Uh, there, you know, I mean, it, I bought this one for 50, I think it's on Amazon now for 80. So it's gone up a little bit, but it's still relatively affordable. And it gives me a good peace of mind, so. And what we've done with that is we've, uh, I think we've got now 25 schools that are either done or in the process uh, um, registering their CO2 amounts in their rehearsals from both choir and band, both high school and collegiate. And so we can take that data and say, okay, so where is everyone at? Uh, how much has it gone up? What has been the infection rate? So all these people have been following what they've been doing for and mitigations and everything, so we can really put some good data to it. Uh, hope it that we can have a recommendation of this level. This level is low risk. This level is level of moderate risk, and this one that this one is high risk. And if you have a high risk level, you should stop rehearsal. Uh, we're hoping to get that soon. The other thing we're looking at is large volume space. What does this mean? Like if you're in a large arena, gymnasium, something like that, something that is a half a million cubic feet or bigger. Um, which most of your band choir rooms will not have that much cubic feet, uh, but something that's really large volume. And then we're looking at a shift between ACH rates because ACH rates, your air change rates per hour, is designed for a smaller classroom style environment, including band rooms that are typically larger. Uh, 
PFM measurements, which is the cubic feet per air coming in, will be used for large volume spaces. Because you have, a, say, a you know three million cubic space arena, uh, you're not going to get an air. You're not even going to get one air change rate per hour in that bad boy because there's just too many uh, too many cubic feet to exchange out. But your your cubic feet per minute per person is what we want to see. We want to find a way to keep that above 50. And so what we're doing now is we're trying to uh, just confirm that our aerosolization uh, cleaning rates follow along with the CFM. And if that comes out to be true, we'll have recommendations for large volume space, which could also be a game changer for some indoor spaces as well. So that's the next phase of the study. Thanks for that uh, sneak peek, if you will. Um, this is a combination of questions. Again, one to include one from the chat. So. Um, a lot of schools in Illinois are starting to push back to um, either hybrid or having full in-person learning. Um, so is there a study plan on the efficacy of masked instruments in smaller spacing? Do you have recommendations for those schools that couldn't accommodate, um, you know, you've got to take band. You can either lose the kid out of the program or you can keep them in the classroom and, and what do we do? Uh, and then similarly, um, we have a lot of schools that have adapted to a block schedule for our learning. So you may not be able to find another space. So if you're sitting in your classroom for 90 minutes, even if you play for a certain amount of time and then you still have the students present, do you have recommendations to uh, think about with either of those situations? Uh, I think I think we're all gonna have to get really creative in what we're doing. And um, I'll, I'll give you an example for, for what I'm doing this semester. Um, I'm, I'm doing a 30 minute either woodwind or brass sectional in my band room and then our theater becomes available during the second part of my rehearsal. So we're moving down the hall to have full band rehearsal in our theater, which is a six story high volume space, a thousand seat uh, theater. And I stand on stage, the players are seated, socially distant in the seating area of the auditorium. And um, we do another 30 minutes uh, with the full band in that space. So if you can sort of come up with a creative way to do part of the rehearsal in your band room, then move to a different area, like a theater, a gymnasium, cafeteria, something with a decent volume of space. Um, you, you can uh, keep everybody at a relatively low risk uh, and, and do the things you want to do. You can also divide your rehearsal block into different activities. So if you play for 30 minutes, you can do some other things like lecture, talk about music history, music theory, where the students just sit and they're masked um, and, and allow the air change rate in the room to uh, do its thing and then get back to uh, rehearsing later on. Um, so these are all things, you know, you'll have to come up with creative solutions in your own situation. Well, I think to, to go on that too, one thing we need to remember is that in classroom size limitations, are going to be um, be temporary because, and I see somebody put in the chat and I'm gonna address that right now. Um, because eventually spring will take hold across all of North America and we can go outside. Once you're outside, those limitations for size kind of go away, right? Your football fields are enormous. Your parking lots are huge. Uh, the auxiliary fields around your, your schools. So we're able to do that. Now I know there's gonna be inclement weather issues that we're gonna have to contend with. But by and large, we will see the opportunity to be outside more with bigger, bigger uh, amounts of students there. The 30 minute rehearsal does play outside as well, but it's e easier to mitigate, right? So like our recommendations are play for 30 minutes, everyone stop, get your water bottles out, drink some water for a couple minutes, go back at it. We wanna get the air to actually rise out of the field and not continue to mix around with people. And so that's the recommendation there. So super easy to do uh, outside. Um, I know that spring is rainy. Uh, I know that uh, you can't always count on a bright, sunshiny day, but it is possible. Um, and then when you come into performances, if you could do an audience list performance, uh, there's lots of ways you can do that by doing it outside, by doing it in the band room, by doing it in the theater. Um, it's just a matter of figuring out how your space is going to work and then live stream it. We have lots of permissions from publishers right now uh, that allow us to do this. So that makes it a lot easier. Um, but the, uh, the, the idea of having, well, I can either have my full band to do something or I can't have band. I can't think we can, we can't accept that. Right. So if it's inconvenient or not having it, I'm going to choose inconvenience. And I think we'll find some creative solutions. 
band directors, if you want to solve a problem, you give it to a band director and they're going to figure it out. I've said that for a long, long time. I'll, I'll just add on to that as well, because I mean, some great, great advice and information there. And I think, you know, as, as Mark was talking about thinking creatively, you know, think about your community involvement. This is a really amazing time to engage with our communities where we don't have the stress of festivals, invitationals, all these things that we typically are involved in. So, you know, maybe there's a local pavilion or a band shell in your community and you can do some of those performances outside. And you can have audiences, you know, showing up. As, as we've heard, it is safer outside. We still have to look at the social distancing that needs to take place with our audience members. You know, so if you're, you're looking at things and you don't necessarily want to live stream or put something together like that, there are other, other options. And that's where, again, you're serving kind of two purposes. You're getting to perform and you're getting to engage with an audience that typically may not even come to our concerts because you're out in the community. So, you know, it's, it's really easy to look at the things we don't get to do. Uh, we really need to look at the things that we can do. And it can be pretty exciting along the way. Not trying to make it sunshine and daisies because there's a lot of frustrations we all know. But, but we do need to think creatively about that and see how we can engage with our community. Thanks, guys. And I'm going to see if I can just pair back because one question specifically, I, you addressed it, but a classroom that has multiple back-to-back -back rehearsals. It is, it is about the playtime, the students being in the room as though they would a normal English class rotating through. That is not as big of a concern as long as, long as they are properly masked. It is the playtime in. Right, so my recommendation there is follow whatever every other classroom is doing in non-playtime. Um, and so if your math classes are meeting for 90 minutes masked with six foot distances between desks, well, you can do the same thing and just substitute 30 minutes of that for rehearsal time. Um, a lot of people are already, but on your suggestions, using um, the masks and bell covers, is there a frequency of which you think that they need to be washed clean? Is there a strategic measure that you've seen that has an effect one way or the other? So we found that the most manufacturer recommendations for washing the bell covers is about once a week and then replacing the MERV 13 filter material about once a month. Let's see, I'm just scanning. But check your manufacturer's recommendations for that. They'll have instructions on it. Or they should anyway. Well, mine will just disintegrate in the washing real, machine. Real quick, if we could, to Mark and James, do you want to, and I don't want to put you on the spot here, but one of the one of the studies talked about, again, the, the, the disposable mask or the... Um, you mentioned it earlier as as you know potential bell covers because I think part, I think everybody out here is thinking oh my gosh I've got to go you know purchase this right. you know ten dollar bell cover for each person and again the science behind this has shown that some of those other options are available yes mm -hmm. yeah so in the study on the trumpet we just rubber banded a uh, surgical mask onto the end of the trumpet and you saw it was even more effective than the MERV 13 material and you can yeah. buy 25 of those for what, $8? Yep. At the beginning of the pandemic, I bought bell covers for my entire marching band, and it was very expensive, almost $6,000. And um, so, some of the instruments uh, are easier to deal with bell covers than others. The clarinets have a rough time with the bell covers that I bought. So we started using the blue surgical masks, rubber banded to the end of the clarinet. And um, that's less effective on the low register than the bell covers that I purchased. So those blue surgical masks uh, of the right quality are, are fantastic for the smaller belled instruments. Can't, can't find one yet for the tuba, but. <laughs> Still looking. Yeah. That's what all the glue on those are for. Um, thanks for that suggestion, guys. That will help, I think, uh, alleviate the stress of a lot of people that are fighting fiscal concerns. Plus, uh, I will throw it in, Brian, if I can. Uh, if you buy the blue surgical style mask, talk to your administration about using CARES Act funds to purchase those uh, for any bell cover because it's technically PPE. Uh, but definitely check with, uh, for, especially for the blue surgical mask, you might be able to use CARES Act dollars for that instead of getting out of your budget. Thanks. Um, let's see, I'm just trying to, again, cover everything on both sides. Um, so, in our state, there is the IHSA, there's our uh, High School Athletic Association um, that I think everybody's pretty, pretty versed on. 
um, there has been just an outpouring of athletics coming back and uh, allowing different regulations and every school is kind of interpreting differently. You've kind of touched on what the recommendations are and been pretty consistent with us about what the recommendations are for us to safely rehearse. Um, we are seeing field houses filled with X number of students, mask, basketball players, et cetera. I know a couple sports of the competitive cheer and wrestling are allowed to remove their masks. Um, and I believe that's more of a safety concern recommendation for an administrator that might come back and say, hey, why are you doing this? Because athletics is allowing this or a band director who's being told, no, I can't rehearse anything, but they're seeing athletics practice. Um, do you have maybe some recommendations of, of language or uh, direction? So one thing you don't want to do is say, if they're doing it, we should be able to do it. Now, I know that's really tempting, but what you don't want to do is put a you versus them, a band versus athletic thing, because I guarantee someone's going to lose and it may not be the person you want to lose. Uh, the better thing to do is say, hey, I see that they're going back. How can I make sure that I can have the same opportunity for my students to participate in our activities? So really, it's the same thing, but it's flipping the script a little bit from being an agitator to being a collaborator. The other thing you want to do is take the study with and say, hey, we have real scientific proof that we can go back with a reduced risk to our students and our people um, through this activity. I really would appreciate it if we can have this conversation on what the science says for us to go back. Um, there is no science for anyone else going back. There's no science for math rooms. There's no science for basketball. There's no science for going into an office. Those things don't exist. This is the one area we have real science that says, here's how you can reduce your risk of going back in. So I think that's the direction I would go. Now that goes with good communication with your administration, right? If you have a poor relationship with that, you may wanna get some more people on that conversation with you. If you have a good positive relationship, that seems like a good way to go. Eat up to talk more, so. Yeah, uh, if you don't mind, uh, James, great, great advice again. And, you know, I think part of this, as we look at this as music educators, it's really easy that we're hearing from many of our parents and our community members. Well, how come they can do this in the athletic world and we don't get to do some of these things? And they've got contact sports taking place and we can't even have performances. So, again, as has been stated from day one and certainly again tonight, you know, let the science speak for you. Um, and again, we know that we can do this safely with that social distancing and all the mitigations in place. So, you know, again, look at what you get to do that we can do based on what the science has provided. And we can't play these comparison games. We've got to get rid of that and we can't, you know, it's difficult. It's difficult because again, many of you, you're answering to community members and parents and things like that, but you've got to hold Hold your ground, if you will, to make sure that we're keeping our students, yourself, and, you know, family safe. Um, again, there's not been any science that has said that it's okay to return to uh, contact sports, um, especially at, at some of these levels where this is taking place. We've seen too many times collegiate programs, professional sports with the best resources, and those programs have been shut down. So I'll end there. Yeah, and I, I want to add that you know, this science study, as, as we hoped it would, provides a pathway forward for music to get back to, to you know, back in, into business here. And we want to make sure that everybody is not cavalier about um, the mitigations. We want you to make sure that you're using the mitigations. The last thing we want to have happen is for a band to go back into a rehearsal situation and have a super spreading event and then literally uh, that is going to have a shockwave effect on the on the entire country and world potentially. So we want to keep this track record of no transmission of virus between uh, students in a music rehearsal. We want to keep that going. Uh, we we don't want anybody to fall off the wagon, so to speak. So um, you know the the science is good. The science is real. The science is working in the real world. And if we if we stick to the science. Uh, we'll be in good shape. And I think it's also important to recognize why we're in this situation where music has to overprove itself. Remember the first super spreader event in the United States was a Skagit Valley Choral incident that happened out in Washington. Uh, because of that, we have, to, we have to be twice as good as everyone else coming back because that is what sticks in the American psyche as far as what spreads the virus. 
Um, and so I think that's, that's something we really need to see. If we would have had some other event, like if it would have been a bar or it would have been some other mass gathering or something like that, we would have seen those things be a uh, super high bar. But because it was our community, we have to set the higher bar. And it, right, wrong, or otherwise, it just is what it is. Thanks, guys. Uh, we're getting close. I do have a couple more questions, if you gentlemen don't mind hanging just for a, a minute or two past. Um, and then please keep the, if there are any questions coming in the chat, because everybody can see and answer those. I did miss this one in the chat. Are there, um, do offset straight rows make a difference? Um, thinking more of like the marching band windows sort of thing. Um, I, I used uh, that, that sort of configuration in our football stadium with my marching band. Uh, we actually used a system called hexagonal loading, which is a, a I, well, I've got a, I've got a sheet here if you want to see it. Um, one of my engineering students designed this or showed, showed it to me. Uh, let's see if I can do that there. So this is called hexagonal loading. So you can see the dots in the middle of each hexagon represent a person. And you can see that that person is no closer than six feet uh, to anyone else. But it's very different than the box loading. It allows for a little, uh, about 18% more people into a space. Now, I use this outdoors because outdoors it's 20 times less likely to be infected by the virus. I'm not using this particular model indoors. Um, but I don't really see a reason why you couldn't, as long as each individual person is still six feet apart from, from the other one. Thanks, and this was cleverly woven uh, of using the marching band. So a lot of us are planning for marching band activities. Apologies with my kid in the background. A lot of us are uh, planning for marching band activities coming up now. Uh, do you have any recommendations for close contact drill, correct intervals of traditional intervals rather than the, the wider? Um, we, we uh, at, at Clemson here, I know uh, Barry had a different situation because of the state mandates, but at Clemson we were able to operate pretty much in a normal situation except uh, we did write drill that kept the students six feet apart. So um, we were not able to do our pregame drill because our pregame has a lot of two-step spacing in it and we do pictures and those pictures just don't read very well if you're at six feet so um, we designed all our drill based on the six foot social distancing guidelines and we uh, you know we did three different halftime shows and um, we were able to do you know a relatively I, I call it relatively normal um, season we had about 80% of our band in the stadium on, on a game day, so we had to rotate 20% of our band. Uh, <clears throat> we had an 11,000 square foot space that we were able to use. Uh, so um, you can do it, you know, you can do it, but you have to, you have to design uh, the drill in such a way to keep them uh, socially distant, even as they're moving. Okay, so coming up for this fall, if I'm hearing correct, um, uh, it, it is still the recommendation to leave six foot spacing intervals uh, for the fall of what would we fall of 2021? Well, I, I think, um, you know, if the CDC happens to change their guidelines on that front, then we can do the same. Uh, we're just following, our, you know, the, the main government entity that sets those um, rules. And, um, you know, if they at some point say, all right, we can go down to four feet, then, you know, I'll go, I'm going to go down to four feet. Um, if they say, you know, back to normal, um, I'm going to go back to normal. So I'm going to follow uh, the government. And I will say the CDC is very slow, very slow to move on anything. So, you know, we're now almost a year into the pandemic. It's been at least... 10 months since a band director figured out that this virus was uh, airborne, um, the CDC has just come into that conclusion within the last month or so. Uh, so they move very slow, you know, these government bureaucracies. So, but, but if they ever do change that six foot distancing guideline, I think we can go with that. Um, I think Brian, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Barry. Go ahead, 
No, nope, no, nope. I was just going to say, I think, I think a big part of this, I know many, many of you out there, especially, you know, when we're looking at public school teaching, you're, you're making those plans now and you're, you're wanting to get those drill plans going. And I think that's where, again, everyone is so ready to get back to normal and, you know, that, that information isn't there yet. And I think that's the part that you've got to be careful of. And I know James has some further information to share about some, some return to, you know, uh, the classroom and specifically as in regard to marching band. But I, I don't think, you know, and again, please guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we can just jump back into thinking, hey, we can just start charting like we used to because we're not there yet. Um, whether the CDC is slow or not, um, it's just we're still, all of these recommendations and, and mitigations are still in place. Um, so maybe that means we have to, we have to pause and, and wait just a little bit longer um, if it looks like things are going to move along quicker, you know, especially with some of the latest things coming from the national government about how many vaccines are going to be, you know, and possibly out there for every American now. That's potentially moved up to May compared to July as of today. So, you know, there is some optimism out there, but, you know, the typical band director side of things, I think we need to be, be patient and, and not just jump into, all right, we're going to write drill like we did in 2019. Let's go. Yeah, and I think that's, a, that's an important part. So I know somebody in the chat put a put the vaccination. We've got to remember a couple of things of the vaccine, right? The vaccine has not had an impact on overall numbers yet. It just hasn't had 15% of the population-ish that has had their first shot. You're not vaccinated until you get your second shot. That second shot vaccination is at 8%. So it's a number, right? This has nothing to do with politics or anything else. It's just math. And so say it's 80%, 15% of one shot or 8%, two shots is a really far cry from 80%. Now those vaccines will continue to increase and they'll increase rapidly, which is really good. However, the thing we have to remember in our space is no vaccine in the US has been approved for anyone under the age of 16 yet. And for anyone 16 and 18, there's one vaccine and that's just the Pfizer vaccine. The other two are 18 and over. And so we have no vaccination for the students that we're going to have within our classrooms. So we need to remember that even though they're looking better, and I hope they continue to look better, but we're starting to see trends plateau. So we need to watch that too, right? I want to be the happy go lucky guy that's like, we're going back, but I've been jaded too much by this year to be ready to do that. So we need to watch out for like the real math that's occurring on the ground. And then when, when all that stuff is there, we'll be ready to go. I think it's going to be easier for us to snap into a regular season than it will be to plan a regular season and snap back over to the socially distant. And we have a, a great real life world, uh, real real world experiment going on, uh, which is happening in my state of South Carolina. Yesterday we opened uh, restaurants and bars to normal capacity and uh, other large events to 50 percent from 20 percent. And uh, uh, as of today, you probably saw the state of Texas has uh, uh, gotten rid of any any COVID guidelines, they're, in, <laughs> they're open for business. So uh, we can watch the numbers in South Carolina and Texas and, and perhaps some other states uh, who are opening up, uh, maybe prematurely, who knows, uh, we'll see. But if the, if the rates in Texas start climbing again, uh, we'll have our answer pretty quickly. Yep. Uh, last question before an endless pile of thanks. Um, and I, I think I've covered everyone in the chat, but. Um, we're seeing in, in Illinois, there are still some schools, particularly the middle schools, that are not able to rehearse. So now we're starting to see a request from the administration of waivers for, from our students and from our families so that they can start playing. I didn't know if you had any experience, uh, has, if that's come across your desk or any thoughts of recommendations. So you mean, in other words, parents would have to sign a waiver that says, if my student gets a, a COVID in a classroom, I'm not going to hold the school responsible? <laughs> yeah, in, in general terms, absolutely. Yeah. A, wa a waiver is only as good as the state it's issued in. Your state doesn't really, like, if you can't legally defend a waiver in your state, which I don't know about Illinois law, uh, then the waiver means nothing. If you can defend a parental waiver, then, right? Yeah, I don't have any good advice. My experiment, my experience as a lawyer is not as uh, much as an aerosol scientist. <laughs> so. I, I do think in that scenario, maybe maybe the best advice, which is not going to be good advice at all. So, you know, take it for what it's worth it is, again, take the science, 
<laughs> take the science and again have that conversation develop that relationship with that administrator or if you have that already just have a sit down conversation with that administrator and show them how this is working in other places and again don't do the comparison games just show them the science and take them through that and again i think there's plenty of resources in in our own state and certainly you know i'm not volunteering mark and james but the type of people that they are that they've committed their their entire year to this so this is something again that there's resources out there because again the whole point of this science is to move us forward to continue to make music in our classrooms for whatever that may mean for each of us based on you know certain circumstances so the the science should really help and i know that's not going to speak to every administrator out there but that's where i think we need to keep going because that's what we know for sure absolutely well gentlemen thank you at the top of the chat for everybody attending um uh, a post at 7 15 barry put um, a link to the study that's up there we can copy and paste that one more time at the bottom um, but endless thanks gentlemen um, i'm sure that we could sit and talk about this all day but uh, Barry needs to go throw his hands in the air because something good just happened to his school. So, um, we no, we, Barry, no, don't tell me. <laughs> yes, we, we really appreciate all of the three of you guys taking the time. And for every attendee, I hope this session was beneficial. Um, we will uh, try and have this transcript available for others to view throughout the state. Um, but uh, I think the resources were shared and, and some very intelligent conversations and, and documentation was shared with us as well. So gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy, busy schedules.